Threshold level power is always, always, always going to suck. Hello friends, welcome back to the channel. If you are new here, my name is Sarah and I make videos about health and fitness and all sorts of stuff, endurance sports. So if that's something that you're into, well maybe you'll mosey on down there to that subscribe button and press it with whatever intensity you feel appropriate so that you can continue to come back to these videos and get a nice side order of snide commentary with a sprinkling of self-deprecation and hopefully some useful information. So think about it. We have time. Think about it. But today I want to talk about structured workouts with so many new people entering the triathlon and cycling sports right now and getting into these indoor training platforms, Zwift, Ruby, Trainer Road, you name it. A lot of people are looking at all of this conversation out there and looking at all these features in these platforms and like, what the hell is going on with workouts? Can you explain workouts to me? What am I looking at? There's all these graphs and charts and colors and letters and numbers and I don't know what the hell I'm looking at, which end is up. And if you haven't done any type of structured training in the past, this is going to look like Swahili to you. So the purpose of this video is to give you kind of a baseline knowledge as to how structured training is going to work, what you're going to see in some of these platforms, and some pretty basic information about physiological adaptations and benefits and side effects of doing some of this training so that you kind of know what to expect, so that you can kind of look at a workout at a glance and know exactly what you're in for instead of kind of riding blind, which can be very difficult. So I'm going to go through some of the fundamentals, talk about all the different training zones, what you can expect. And at the end, I'll talk about erg mode a little bit for those of you who have smart trainers with erg mode available. Uh, it's a subject matter that's confusing to a lot of folks because it's not very well explained in text. So hopefully I can give you a little clarity on that as well. So let's talk about structured training and how we should approach it with the basics. First and foremost, if you are brand new to cycling or brand new triathlon, whatever's bringing you onto the bike, I want you to not look at structured training if you're in your first two to three months. I really want you to just go out there, either ride on the road or ride on Zwift and just play, okay? Have fun, test your fitness out, build up that endurance, build up those muscles, get used to riding. You can work hard, there's no problem with that. If you wanna join a race here on Zwift or you wanna you know, look at some KOM efforts either on the road or on Zwift or if you wanna go for those sprint banners, just play around, push yourself a little bit. But right now in the very beginning, right off the couch, you might not have the endurance built up to really handle structured training. So you really need to start building up at least a base level of endurance to be able to absorb some of the training. The other thing I want you to do is if you have power available on your bike outdoors or if you're using something like Zwift, I want you to just kind of start paying attention to that power number. Making a mental note of it at certain different levels of effort. When you're working really hard, glance at that power number and just kind of process what that is. Start to look for trends over time. It's going to change. You're going to improve as you get a little bit more fit, but just get an idea of how you feel at different zones of power. That's going to be a little bit more valuable when you start to get into structured training training so that you know what you're looking for. Now, assuming that you've done that first two to three months of just getting your endurance built up, the next thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to do an FTP test. So you hear this term FTP thrown around. An FTP is an acronym that stands for functional threshold power. You might also hear this termed as threshold power or threshold level power. There's all sorts of different terms thrown around to mean the same thing. So what is FTP? What is your functional threshold power supposed to do? Well, functional threshold power is actually a proxy for a term known as lactate threshold. And this is more of an advanced scientific concept when it comes to training. And what lactate threshold is, is actually an output level that's that break even point between how quickly the body is building up lactate in the muscles and how quickly the body can kind of flush that or clear that to continue to work. When lactate builds up, you start to break down. You feel that burning sensation in your muscles and your body starts to slow down and break down. Threshold brings you just under that break down point where you can sustain it. And the testing protocol is really supposed to give you an approximation for what you can hold for an hour before that lactate starts to build up at a rate faster than the body can clear it. So if you're above that level, you're building up lactate too fast for the body to clear in real time. And if you're below that level, well, you you're in that safe zone and you can kind of ride indefinitely, failing anything else like not bringing enough fuel on board or just kind of soreness or whatever other types of you know, mitigating factors there might be to break you down. It, lactate will not be the mitigating factor. So in the course of an entire ride, you can ride over that threshold rate and then clear that lactate by recovering under that threshold rate. That's a lot of what you're going to see in structured training. Really high intensity and then a chance to kind of clear that lactate and recover 
recover and then coming back to high intensity and clear that lactate and recover. So we'll look at that more in detail when I show you the different zones. So lactate threshold in particular needs to be tested in a lab. You need to have somebody taking your blood and testing how many millimoles of lactate are in the system and to see how quickly the body is clearing it. It's not really a practical application for most of us. It's not repeatable. You're not going to be able to do it all that often. It's expensive and it really doesn't have a whole lot of value. So what researchers have come up with is the ability to get a really good approximation of that number without having to get pricked with a needle and have your blood tested. And that's done through repeatable testing. All you need is a power meter and a bike, and then you do certain structured style of testing, and that is going to elicit a number for you that's going to give you an approximation of that lactate threshold. So the next question is why is that number even important? Well, in that research, Andrew Coggin in particular, the granddaddy of structured training and periodized training, had figured out that there are some standard deviations around the mean in terms of what type of output and what type of adaptations the body is making at certain percentages of that functional threshold power. And you're able to build predictable zones around that functional threshold power that will elicit change and allow athletes to improve by mixing and matching those different outputs in a manner that is going to add enough stimulus to the body so that you're going to improve your fitness and threshold power over time. So he's built a number of different zones that we use pretty predictably in these programs and in training plans that you work in for specific results, specific physiological adaptations, and specific reasons. Now, there are a number of ways to do an FTP test to get that number generated for you. You'll see a number of different protocols on different platforms, but most of them are gonna fall in these couple of camps here. So there's some sustained effort type of tests one of them is an eight minute test and it gives you two eight minute intervals with a 10 minute rest in between them. And it's going to take 90% of your average between those two eight minute intervals and it's going to populate an FTP value for you. Uh, this is a testing protocol that you're going to see on a couple of different platforms. And it used to be used a lot more commonly, but I think what they found is statistically that tends to overread. The reason that the eight minute test was even created from the original 20 minute test, which I'll talk about in a minute, a lot of people have a very difficult time pacing an effort upwards of 20 minutes. So eight minutes was a little bit easier for people to wrap their head around, but I see a lot more folks just kind of moving away from the eight minute test. Some people still use it. It still has value and efficacy, but you're gonna see, but you're gonna see that a lot less. The next one is a 20 minute test, which is the standard. This is the original test where you're going to do basically a 20 minute long effort as hard as you can sustain. You wanna do it stably. You don't wanna be spiking all over the place. You wanna go as steady state as you possibly can for 20 minutes. And then it's going to take 95% of that. And why is it taking 95%? It's because it's trying to extrapolate that out for the hour. So taking 95% of that effort is going to get you a pretty close approximation of what your one hour lactate threshold power is. Now, both of these tests are going to be designed so that it's kind of pre-fatiguing the muscles a little bit with some harder efforts in here so that it's going to get you within that five to 10% so that they can do the proper math. The third type of test you're gonna see are the ramp tests here. And that has become the new gold standard for testing. And the reason for that is because a lot of people have a really hard time pacing efforts, especially if you don't already know what your FTP is, how are you going to to know what you can hold if you haven't actually done a test before. So people tend to test pretty poorly and it underestimates their FTP and it doesn't really build a very good training format for them. So the ramp test came up, so it kind of takes that pacing element out of it. All it's doing is it's going to add a particular interval of wattage to your effort minute over minute. And the idea is that you just ride until you can't put out the power anymore. And then it's going to take about 75% of your best one minute power. So you're fatiguing as you kind of go through the ramps. And then at a certain point, it's usually depending on which format of the test you use, it's going to be between five and 25 minutes to failure. Usually the sweet spot and a good failure rate is somewhere in that 20 to 25 minutes. But as you're newer to cycling, you may fail earlier. Now. There are different formats. I would say that the best ramp test format of all of the different platforms is on Trainer Road. They actually spearheaded the ramp test and it's built around your previous FTP. So the intervals are more built around you. Uh, the rest of them really use a more cookie cutter approach. But if you're gonna use them in Zwift, there's two different versions of this test. One is the standard ramp test and that's meant for larger riders and more experienced riders. And that uses a 20 watt jump every minute. Now that might be too big of a jump, especially as you get later on into the test where you might be approaching fatiguing and failure, but the next jump is just, just a little too high, but you might've been able to do it at 10 watts, but 
20 watt jump was just too much for you. So what they came up with is a light version of the test and that's intended for smaller riders or newer riders. So it makes those little steps a little bit shorter so that you can kind of adjust into that higher level of power. You don't want people to pre-fatigue or break down too early because the jump was too large. So those are the two tests available on Zwift. If you're newer, I recommend the light test. And if you're going to, if you have your choice at which program to use for the uh, ramp test, I would definitely recommend Trainer Road because that one's meant and built around you specifically, your power specifically, and those ramp rates are going to vary by rider so that everybody's kind of failing at that same amount of pre-fatigue. So you get a pretty accurate approximation of your FTP. But I know that the FTP test is a lot. I just threw a lot at you. You don't necessarily have to understand all the nitty gritty of how the tests work. I just recommend if you are a beginner, hang out on this side over here and, and do a ramp test and just ride until you fail. You may fail early, that's okay. That's not a big deal. You know, there's plenty of time to test. You can always come back to it. The one thing that you wanna focus on is make sure that when you do the test, that you're fresh, that you're properly fueled up and you're ready to go. You don't wanna do this at the end of an arduous day at work. You wanna do this when you have the energy and the commitment to get the test done so that you have the most accurate number that you can possibly get. So now that you have this FTP number, the software is gonna go out there and do the math for you and put your zones in there and generate them for you based on these known percentages that have been established for years. These are the standard zones for everybody. Now, everybody's going to kind of fall with those break points between the zones a little bit different. We all have slight biological differences, but they're close enough that we're able to use a standard for everybody. So I'm gonna go through the zones and explain to you what each zone does, a few things about it that you should know, and then you can know what you're looking at when you look at a particular workout. So the first thing that you're going to see is zone one. And zone one in Zwift in particular is delineated as a gray zone. And zone one is recovery. That's all that it is. It is active recovery. This is what you're going to see. You might see this during the course of a warm up, and that's fine. You're going to see this gray zone in between hard efforts. And if you are planned to have an active recovery day, you might see an entire ride that keeps you like this in that gray zone for the entire ride. You shouldn't be exceeding a, a one hour ride in this gray zone. And this is not where you wanna spend a whole lot of your time. You might hear some conversation about base miles. I'll talk about that in a moment. But base miles are not done at zone one. Zone one is not building any level of fitness. It is only for recovery. The only physiological benefit you are getting in this gray zone is going to be recovery level effort, helping to kind of clear some of that lactate, recovering the heart rate, getting the blood moving. Now zone one is going to include anywhere between 1% and about 58%. You might see different software break it down at 55% or 60%. They all might do it a little bit different, but it's somewhere around that 58% point of your FTP that it's going to be within that recovery zone. And the fuel that you're going to be burning in this zone is going to be primarily fat and then obviously oxygen. You're going to be oxygenating your muscles because you're at a very low intensity here. So this is going to be your active recovery zone. So when you see gray on Zwift or see a really low level that's uh, about 58% or less of your FTP, you're in your recovery zone. That brings us into zone two. Zone two is your endurance zone. On Zwift, it's going to be shown as blue. You may see other colors on different platforms. But zone two and in your endurance zone, this is where your base miles live. This is your go all day aerobic zone. This is going to feel easy. You're gonna have some tension in the legs, so you're going to be working, but it's definitely something that you can withstand for a long period of time. And that's going to be between 59% and 75% of that FTP number that you're going to get. And this is where you're going to build a lot of your aerobic fitness. And you wanna spend a good amount of time here, especially in the beginning. This is going to have a lot of great benefits in terms of building mighty mitochondrial density, building your aerobic engine, building your repeatability, bringing your heart rate down for that specific level of effort. The more miles that you're able to put in your legs, a lot of them are going to be here. The stronger and better of an athlete you are going to be over time. If you look to the pros, pro cyclists, pro triathletes, if you look at the ages at which they are at the top of their game, with the exception of maybe very short sprint level efforts, most of those endurance athletes start to hit their peak in their mid to late 20s into their early to mid 30s. And some of them continue to improve well up to in their early 40s. You know, we see a lot of these athletes continue to improve with time, but why is that? It's because they're continuing to build that base with these zone two miles. They're just putting the miles in the legs. If you think of your fitness in terms of endurance sport as a pyramid, 
you know, you can build that base as wide or as narrow as you want, but the width of that base is going to directly correlate to how high of a pyramid that you're going to be able to build. So if you're not going to spend a whole lot of time building that base level aerobic fitness and that ability, you're not going to be able to peak out that high. So you want to spend a good amount of time here and working on these fundamentals in that aerobic zone. It's not a sexy zone to ride in. It's not super high power. It's not going to be exceptionally fast, but it's so important. And you're going to become a stronger and faster cycle in the long run by spending the appropriate amount of time here. Now, when you're in this zone, you're still primarily burning fat with a small amount of carbs and then oxygen for fuel. The next zone is zone three, and that's going to be your tempo zone. You've maybe even heard this term tempo before. Runners use this a lot, cyclists use this a lot. And tempo is going to be that brisk pace. It's going to be challenging, but not so difficult that you're going to break down. You can usually hang out in zone three for quite a long period of time. It's not something that's going to break you apart but you're not talking as quickly. It's not quite as fluid or easy as zone two. You're able to hold it, but you have to put some intentionality at holding at zone three. And zone three is an important zone. This is the area where when you're doing a harder effort, like a group ride or a race, you wanna be able to start to kind of recover here. Where we talked about our gray recovery zone, you're not necessarily able to go all the way down into that zone one area to recover. Sometimes to keep up with the group, you need to be able to recover from hard efforts. And a lot of that is done here at that tempo zone. You need to be able to kind of jump in and out of this zone pretty readily. Now, zone three for tempo is going to keep you between 75 and 85% of your FTP. And it's going to start to now be a little bit more even in terms of how much fat you're burning versus glucose and then uh, oxygen is still your primary fuel source for your muscles. So now you're gonna start to bring some sh more sugars on board, make sure that you're kind of keeping up with the demands of zone three. Now, what you may hear about zone three is that it's that gray zone, that no man's land, that don't train in zone three because it's not going to have a good effect for you. And you have to understand the context behind that. And what zone three tends to do is it captures a lot of just people who are riding without structure. So people who go out and ride on the road or free ride on Zwift, they think that they're working hard because they're putting in a good solid effort. They wanna do a 90 minute ride or two hour ride and they're riding it all in zone three and they think that they're working hard. Their heart rate's up, they've got tension in their legs and they are working hard. But the problem with it is, is that it's not quite high enough intensity to bring on the adaptations and build your FTP and it's not quite low enough intensity to get the massive amount of benefits that you would get in terms of your aerobic engine and your durability that you're going to get from zone two. It's, it's too hard to get that aerobic benefit and it's, it's not quite hard enough to really get that power benefit. So spending too much time Time in zone three could actually just kind of stagnate your training. So you want to introduce zone three with purpose, right? You can see kind of here you have some intervals at zone three. It's a good area to maybe to do some low cadence drills or high torque drills, or just to kind of work on different fundamentals, but you don't want to be spending all of your rides in zone three. You want to be doing it with purpose. Your next zone up is going to be your zone three plus. This is termed as your sweet spot zone. You may see this abbreviated as SST, and this is going to be the bridge between your tempo zone and your threshold zone. Now this is still technically zone three, but there's a reason we've carved out kind of a special nomenclature for this sweet spot zone. And that's because sweet spot is where some of the benefits of cycling all converge at the most efficient combination, right? It's not the best at anything. It's not the best at those aerobic adaptations and it's not the best at those high power adaptations, but it gives you a really solid bang for your buck for everything. And it's a very well balanced training zone. So it's a good place where you can kind of work at pushing your threshold level power up from the bottom. When you work at your threshold zone, you're going to get a greater training stimulus. You're working harder. So immediately speaking, you're getting a better bang for your buck by doing threshold, but you can't recover from threshold as readily as you can from your aerobic level zones in zone three. So zone three plus or your sweet spot zone is kind of that compromise where you can be working in that sliver just below your threshold level and you can continue to come back to that zone over and over and over again with minimal recovery because you're not putting too much demand on the body to not be able to recover 
recover and come back to do it the same day as you might with threshold as we'll see going forward. And sweet spot is going to be that small sliver between 85 and 95% of your FTP. There's some schools of thought that bring that up to 97% of your FTP, but the average is usually around 95%. And at that point you are still burning a combination of glucose and fat and obviously oxygen for fuel for your muscles. Now what you're probably going to see out there is some contentious debate over what's the better training methodology, spending a lot of time in this you know, perfect land of sweet spot or doing more polarized training where you're working that endurance zone and then working your really high end zones. The reality is, is that there really isn't one better than another. It's not either or, it's both and. If you're properly structuring your training throughout the course of the year, you're touching on all of your zones and doing short stints, maybe four, six, eight weeks, focusing on sweet spot can give you a really good benefit in terms of bringing up that FTP and being able to put in a lot of volume without breaking the body down too much that you might be doing at those higher intensities. But you can't do zone three up plus all the time either. It's one of those things where, you know, first of all, you have to add more stimulus if you wanna make adaptations. You're just going to adapt to that, that sweet spot zone and you might not be challenging yourself enough to grow anymore. And the other thing is it's a bit of a grind. I've done high volume sweet spot training before. It works really well for four to six weeks, maybe eight weeks tops. But after that, you really start to just break down mentally. It's just arduous, it's hard enough to really be a little bit taxing, even though you're recovering mentally, it's tough to look at, it's boring. So you wanna kind of sprinkle this in with different types of training and kind of move from periodized areas of your training. There's a lot of literature out there in terms of periodization. I, I would highly recommend you kind of look into some of that stuff if you're interested in more of the training methodologies. But suffice it to say, to be able to add enough stimulus to the body to continue to improve over time, you need to kind of change that stimulus, right? You need to kind of challenge the body in different ways. You can't just ride at the same intensity, at the same power output every single time and expect to continue to improve. So that sweet spot, and that brings us into the next zone, which is zone four. Zone four is your threshold. This is right around your FTP. And this is a very small sliver because it's trying to keep you in that little box, right? It's trying to keep you in that lactate threshold break even point where the lactate's not building up past your capacity to clear it. So it's really small window, 95 to 105%. So you're gonna see this kind of in your yellow zone here, and you might see this, this line here for your FTP. It's gonna keep, keep you really tight around that line. Now let me warn you, despite what this nice pretty yellow color might indicate, I don't care how experienced you are as a rider, doesn't matter if you've been riding for 50 years or 50 minutes, threshold level power is always, always, always going to suck. There's a cliche in cycling that says it never gets any easier, you just get faster. And that's really the best way to describe threshold. It's never going to feel any better. If it starts to feel easy, it's, it's probably no longer your FTP. That means your FTP has probably gone a little bit higher. It's always going to be challenging. It's always going to suck. It's an important level of power to work at so that you're able to continue to push that upward. It's going to be where you live very often when it comes to challenging events or competitive events, whether it's a race or a hill climb. Threshold is very important, but don't ever be under the illusion that threshold is going to feel easy for you. It's, it's going to be difficult. So this nice pretty yellow color that's you know nice and happy like the sun, it's not your happy place. So get used to it. When you see that yellow, expect hard. This is where you might be able to blurt out a word or two at a time, but you're, you're not really comfortable here. Now, another point that I wanna bring up here in terms of threshold, you know, I mentioned that it's a proxy for your one hour lactate threshold. You may see some bro science out there where people are telling you if you can't hold your FTP for an hour, then it's not your FTP. This is categorically false. This is just, again, bro science. The reason that you cannot hold your FTP for an hour has nothing to do with your FTP being wrong and more to do with the fact that you just need to build up the other systems in your body to support your biological capacity to clear that lactate. Remember, it's built on lactate, not on physical capacity. You probably don't have the muscular endurance or the cardiovascular endurance to build up to that one hour power. In fact, a lot of the pros out there are incapable of holding their FTP for an hour. It's not really practical. The only people who are focusing on holding that FTP for an hour are time trial specialists or hill climb specialists that need to hold that steady state at their FTP. Some of the best time trialists can actually get above their FTP for an hour and really manage that lactate buildup. But don't think that you have to develop your capacity to ride at your zone four, your threshold power for an hour for that 
that to be an accurate number. Your time is better spent doing other things. Unless you're going to be focusing on time trials, if you're just riding to be competitive out there in, in standard races or group rides or just climb those hills and get those KOMs and QOMs, I wouldn't worry about matching up your one hour power to this number. It's really not gonna be a great value for your time. But if you see that out there, don't be dismayed if you can't hold this level of power for an hour. It sucks for five minutes, it sucks for 10 minutes, it sucks for 30 minutes, it sucks for an hour. It just sucks for any period of time, so don't be scared off by that. And when you're working at your threshold rate, this is going to be where you're going to be burning primarily glucose. You're still burning fat. You're always burning a little bit of fat, but now you're really becoming reliant on glucose. But you're still using oxygen to fuel your muscles. You're still not at the point where you're going fully anaerobic. You're still mostly aerobic here. You're tickling on that anaerobic level. It really does depend on your training as well. But at this point, you're still able to use oxygen to fuel your muscles and, and sustain these efforts for longer periods of time. And the last zone or collection of zones is your zone five. And sometimes you'll see it as zone five, six, seven, and this covers your VO2 max zone. Now, most softwares are really only going to lump these all together. And the reason for that is because once you get past threshold and into VO2 max, the distribution around the mean and the power curves is really going to start to fall apart. You can have two riders, the same height, the same weight, the same FTP, the same number of years on the bike, and they have vastly different capacities to work above threshold. One of them might be able to hold 140% of their FTP for five minutes, and one of them might only be able to hold 120% of their FTP for five minutes. It's really difficult to find percentage breakpoints between these zones, so we more often describe them as your capacity for a certain period of time. Zone five is going to be basically your three to five minutes, maybe upward of eight minute power. Now, most riders can actually do to three to five minutes at between 105 and 120% of their FTP. So that's going to cover the bulk of your riders. But going beyond that, that's where things really start to fall apart. Zone six covers your, basically your 30 seconds to upwards of three minutes and three minutes max. This is kind of draining the tank, right? If you're at the end of a race, your lead out for a sprint, if you watch professional racing, this is where you know where the finish line is and you're just dumping everything that you have left. And that could be anywhere on the percentages. There really is no good average, but that's what you're going to understand when you hear, maybe you'll see in one of the workout prompts, something about zone six. That's where you're going to maybe do your one minute power test. That's going to be in your zone six. And zone seven is going to be your neuromuscular level power. And neuromuscular power is exactly what it sounds like. It's basically your brain beating your muscles into submission and basically telling them to contract as fast as they can until failure. And that's basically going to be your sprint level power, right? Your 10 to 15 seconds, your 20 seconds, that's neuromuscular level power. So your VO2 max level zone, which I'm showing as zone five here, that's gonna be 105% plus of your FTP and the way that it divides out for your one minute, three minute, five minute power, your sprint level power, it's going to depend on you. Everybody is a little bit different. It just depends on your profile as a rider. But regardless of where you are in this VO2 max level power, you're burning glucose. You're really burning very little fat at this point. And the reason it's called VO2 max is because the, the muscles are no longer using oxygen for fuel. These are your type two fast twitch muscle fibers that have a very short shelf life in terms of execution of power. You're limited to that maybe upwards of five minutes, eight minutes max if you've really developed your VO2 max level efforts. But this is, this is very short lived. This is why it's red, it's scary, it's hard, it hurts. And the best thing that you can do in terms of your training is to not only bring the power level up at those different zones, but to make it more repeatable. You'll get a lot more value in being able to repeat those efforts more throughout the course of an hour. You might only be able to do two of these in an hour when you're, when you're a beginner, maybe just one. But over time, you might be able to get to the point where I can do, okay, I can do three. Now I can do four, five, six. So working your repeatability with these zone five efforts or these VO2 max level efforts is going to make you much faster and much stronger as a cyclist. And it's going to help you to bring your FTP up from the top. So I know if you're new to cycling, understanding all of these zones may feel like it's just overwhelming and very foreign to you. And it'll make more and more sense as you get more experience, as you kind of read some of the on-screen prompts on some of these training platforms, they help to continue to reiterate these ideas. But the purpose for me going through all of these is to explain what you can expect to feel, 
how long you can expect to hold this level of power and how you can appropriately fuel. So if you're burning primarily fat for fuel, you don't need to bring as much sugar on board. You still need to fuel with calories because when you're burning calories, eventually you're going to run out. You can, what's termed as bonking, where you just kind of run out of fuel and go upside down and you've drained the glycogen out of your muscles and you no longer have anything to burn in terms of a fuel source. But you can go longer at zone one and zone two without bringing on exogenous sugars and fuels because you're burning primarily fat. And as you move up through the zones, you become more and more reliant on sugar, and you want to make sure that you're fueling with sugar appropriately. You do not want to diet on the bike. Always fuel for performance on your rides, and as you increase your power, if you're looking at weight loss as a cyclist, I cannot stress this enough. Trying to starve yourself on the bike is going to end up resulting in fewer calories burned because your power output is going to suffer. So, you know, make those good nutritional decisions off the bike, fuel your rides appropriately, that will raise your power level, and that's going to in turn burn more calories for you. But always fuel on the ride so that you can, especially some of these higher level efforts, right? Your threshold, your VO2 max level efforts. You run out of sugar, you fail. I'm telling you, I've done this myself before. The most experienced ones of us out there do this all the time. We forget, right? We forget to put a gel in our pocket or we forget to put something on our trainer desk and we don't fuel up appropriately. We run out of sugar and we shut down because the muscles need to be fueled. So make sure that you're fueling appropriately. That's why I've kind of included some of this detail down below. That's kind of the basics of what you need to know. You really don't need to be a data junkie for this stuff. You just need to understand the zones what kind of fuel sources you're going to need on board. And you should be able to look at your power and say, okay, I know what zone I'm in. I know what the objectives are. I know how long I can hold this and what it's supposed to feel like. So now let's jump into erg mode and we'll talk about how you can use erg mode in terms of your structured training on all of the different platforms. Now they're all gonna function the same way. So let's talk about the difference between standard or resistance mode or erg mode. So your first mode is generally termed as one of a few things. You'll see it as resistance mode, you'll see it as level mode, you'll see it as slope mode. But basically what that is, is that it's a fixed resistance. There's usually some kind of slider in the program and it sets a fixed resistance on your trainer. And then what you do is you look at the power output that is required on the screen and then you shift and move your legs to match it. And that's the whole thing, right? You just have to match that power, you have to adjust accordingly, and you, you shift to get into those different levels of output and different levels of resistance. The trainer will not change. If you have a smart trainer, it may be capable of erg mode, where it is able to adjust around you. So in erg mode, it's working kind of around your setup. So you're picking a gear to start with, and what it's doing is it's gonna detect your current power against what's being demonstrated on the screen in terms of your target power, and it's going to add or subtract resistance depending on where you are on that curve. So if you are putting out too much power, it's going to take some of that resistance away to tell you to, hey, put a little bit less force into the pedals. And if you are too low in the power, it is going to add resistance so that you are going to put a little bit more force into the pedals until that you can match and you can hold, and then it's going to hold resistance as long as you are at the target power. This is going to eliminate the need to shift. Now you can shift, there's a couple of good reasons to shift. One of those is if you're jumping from like in a recovery rate up into a VO2 max level effort and you wanna get up there faster, sometimes shifting to a harder gear can just help you jump that power a little bit faster instead of waiting for the braking mechanism to start working in your trainer. Now, the other reason you might wanna shift is maybe you've drifted off. You've lost a little bit of focus, right? Your, your cadence starts to drop down. You're feeling a little bit uncomfortable with your leg speed being a little too slow and too much torque in the legs. You can shift into an easier gear just to spin up your legs more quickly. It's usually a little bit easier to do that than trying to spin your legs up to get the resistance mode to kind of let off and adjust a little bit for that higher leg speed. Either way, you can do it whatever way you want, but you're not required to shift when you are in erg mode. The benefit of erg mode is really supposed to be A, not having to shift and deal with that power loss, but mostly it's so that you don't lose that time to adjustment. Most people who aren't very seasoned in cycling and many who are, don't have a good appraisal for what it feels like to be at a certain power level. So they might overshoot or undershoot the power and they might spend a good portion of the interval just trying to kind of dial in and match the number on the screen. Erg mode kind of takes the guesswork out of it. It gets you up to the power and then it just holds you there. 
The other thing is it kind of keeps you honest to the interval. It doesn't really let you dip down below too much. If you're working in resistance mode or slope mode, you can kind of maybe lose a little bit of power on the interval and it's still gonna let you continue. Erg mode's just going to kind of keep you honest. It's going to keep you in a really tight locus around that target power. Both ways of training are completely valid. You know, they both have a great deal of efficacy. People who are going to tell you that erg mode is doing the work for you, is it's absolutely ridiculous. That's not how it works. It's just kind of holding the resistance so that you you don't have to worry about the variability that might come with trying to kind of match the power on the screen. One of the arguments is, well, on the real road, you have to shift and focus on power. Well, on the real road, you're not staring at your power meter either. If you are, you're probably crashing into something or somebody's crashing into you. So yes, on the real road to adjust to terrain, you're going to have to shift, but the purpose of structured training is not to really simulate the real road as it is to develop power systems. So use erg mode to your advantage. Now, for a lot of new riders, what happens is they try erg mode once and they absolutely hate it. And the reason that they hate it is because it's foreign. We're used to adjusting our power in a certain way. We're used to changing our shifting patterns and changing our cadence, and we don't relinquish our control. So what happens is people end up fighting the trainer because the trainer's adding resistance and then they're still trying to adjust. Instead of just kind of holding and letting it come to them, they're trying to fight against the trainer and it becomes a very miserable experience for them. Another reason people get jammed up on erg mode is if you're doing intervals that are just kind of a little bit outside of your capability, just on the day, maybe you're a little bit tired that day what happens is you're just under that power level or your cadence is starting to drop off and what happens is that the programs are reading this as a loss of power and they're going to continue to add resistance to keep you on target but if you're not capable of holding the target then you're just going to continue to bog down in this what's known as the death spiral until your legs come to a halt if you're in resistance mode or slope mode you're able to continue pedaling even if maybe you're five or ten percent off of the target power now there's a few ways to work around this and you're actually able to in these programs you can turn off your erg mode and set it to incline mode or resistance mode in these programs and then when you get kind of get back onto the target you can move back into erg mode or if it's just too hard for you on that day most of these programs allow you to turn down your bias for your resistance and then turn down the difficulty maybe you just need to turn it down to 95 percent that's going to change all your targets for the rest of the workout so that you can finish the workout still get a hard workout in and you don't necessarily have to fail you don't necessarily have to hit 100 percent of your workout to make it on the day it doesn't matter if you have been cycling for 20 years. Sometimes we just fail workouts. It's just not our day. That's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But the biggest thing is that I would recommend as a newer rider and a newer person to do erg mode, try out erg mode on easier workouts. Don't jump right into that really high intensity interval session. Try it on maybe a zone two or zone three level workout, just so you can kind of get used to what it's doing. And then when you start to really get comfortable with erg mode, then you start to push into the harder workouts. And and then you're not fighting the trainer anymore. You're used to how it's behaving. So, so many people just try to go all in and then they hate it and then they never come back to it. Another tip for erg mode is that you want to set your gearing into a pretty straight chain line. What's going to happen is if you set it in the small ring and like a big cog in the rear, that flywheel is actually going to be moving pretty slowly because the brake is going to be on very heavily because it's trying to counteract the fact that you're in basically your granny gear. So it's going to move really slow. You're going to get a really low inertia drag feel and it's not going to be very comfortable. Conversely, if you're in the big ring in the front and you're a very small cog on the cassette, what's going to happen is that flywheel is going to whip up really, really fast. It's almost going to feel like you're going to spin out. So finding a nice spot in the middle, that kind of middle part of the cassette in the big ring, nice straight chain line, it's usually the perfect point for good uh, inertia feel and to keep control of the power output in erg mode. Last thing specific to Zwift users, whenever you are in workout mode that's controlled by Zwift specifically, there is no impact of the gradient at all. It's completely turned off and the trainer is now listening to the workout mode, whether it's resistance or erg, and it's completely ignoring the gradient. So as such, trainer difficulty will have no impact on it and you don't have to worry which terrain you choose. It's not going to impact your ride. You don't have to worry about shifting or adjusting. All of that control is being segmented off to the workout mode and not the terrain anymore on the map. But I know this was a bit of a long video. There is a lot of information here. Hopefully this is helpful to newer riders that you know what you're looking at. You're probably not going to remember all of this at once. You know, people generally remember about 40% of what they're exposed to, but hopefully some of this will become familiar. And as you continue to do workouts, you look at the on-screen prompts, you look at the graphs, this will jog your memory and you'll come to understand, oh, I'm in my green zone. I know that that's my, my tempo zone. I know this is going to feel challenging, but I can hold this for a long time. 
hey, I'm in my red zone. I know this is very short and punchy portion of my power curve. I'm not gonna be able to hold this for very long. Oh, there's a lot of red on the graph. I better make sure that I'm fueled up and I have sugar on board. Hopefully you'll be able to take some of these heuristics and fundamentals and apply them to your training. But if you have any comments or questions, please leave them down below. I'll do my best to help you guys out down there. If you have gotten any value out of this video, I'd appreciate it if you hit that thumbs up button. It really does help this video get out in front of other folks that might find some value in this information as well. Subscribe if you haven't already. Check out some other training videos over here. And as always, I will catch you guys in the next one. See ya.